and Jung had say <laughs> um, Hello, uh, thank you so much for having me here today. I wanted to start by saying it's a real honor to, to be here um, in Korea, um, and thank you for coming. Um, my name is Fran, and I'm a member of a, co a collective called Assemble, who operate across the fields of art, architecture, and design. Um, we're composed of 17 individuals who've been working together since 2010, realizing a wide range of work, um, the types of which I firstly wanted to kind of give a brief overview of um, as a means of introduction to who we are. Um, so we work in development and construction of architectural projects, predominantly in the UK, but also further afield. Um, so for example, this is a tasting room for Kamakatsu Brewery in Japan. Um, we've built a kind of number of temporary projects. So this is a theater that was designed to kind of expose the systems of backstage uh, mechanics, the fly system. Um, we've created exhibitions on topics or people who are inspiring to our work. For example, this one is about the incredible female uh, architect, Lena Bobardi. And this one looked at the overlap between brutalist architecture and play. Um, we're interested in a kind of social practice, so we often organize events and do programming within our projects. And we're starting to move into publishing, books, film, radio. Um, we're involved in manufacturing products, um, including furniture and architectural components. So this is a chair we designed and produced for a project which recently opened for Goldsmiths Center of Contemporary Arts. Um, we undertook a research project with Armitage Shanks, who are Britain's leading toilet manufacturer to develop a prototype for a kind of marbled um, toilet. Um, yeah, I guess, we're, so we have a very hands-on approach to practice, and we're interested in how design principles and priorities and projects can trickle down from the scale of a building to the products and items you're using within that space. For example, these beer vessels developed for the brewery in Kamikatsu are made using a kind of glaze, uh, which was based on the beer yeast um, used in the brewery. And this is a range of products developed through processes to always have outcomes that were different, and so to try and reflect the unique lives that play out in people's home, so homeware. Um, we're really interested in the role of design also kind of extending to non-physical and social concerns, so that has m more recently um, come about in establishing organizations. So this is Black Horse Workshop, um, in Northeast London, which is a public access workshop space, a library for tools, if you will. Um, and the project was conceived as, as a pilot, so it was only meant to have a one-year lifespan. But we put structures in place to give it a chance um, to continue to exist in the long run. We established a separate company and recruited staff, and we still sit on the board. Um, so I was asked to speak today about public space for arts, culture, and education. So um, to start that, I would like to talk a little bit about my position on what those words mean to me and the concepts, how they relate to one another. Um, and I really wanted to start with this quote from Simon Nicholson, which comes from an essay called um, A Theory of Loose Parts. And I will just read it quickly. Um, so creativity is for the gifted few. The rest of us are compelled to live in the environments constructed by the gifted few. Listen to the gifted few's music, use the gifted few's inventions and art, and read poems, fantasies, and plays by the gifted few. This is what our education and culture conditions us to believe. And this is a culturally induced and perpetuated lie. Building upon this lie, the dominant cultural elite tell us that the planning, design, and building of any part of the environment is so difficult and so special that only the gifted few, those with degrees and certificates in planning, engineering, architecture, and so on, can properly solve environmental problems. So perhaps more than any other form of culture, the built environment makes the ideas and spaces that it contains 
seem like firm and inevitable facts, but it does not just reflect or contain culture, the built environment actively perpetuates it and reinforces cultural ideas about how individuals relate to each other and the rest of society. Our values, our ambitions, our right to access resources, to be and act in particular ways and in particular places. This is perhaps most directly readable in like skyscrapers as symbols of capital or cathedrals and temples as powerful expressions of religious culture. In the UK and particularly in London where Assemble is based, um, capital, either real or speculative, is what by and large defines the development of the built environment. But nothing is static and everything is contingent. And I think it's really our jobs, yours and mine, um, to be able to think critically and question the way things are and develop ways of working that can be better than that. Um, so our work is really based on the idea that the city, a good city is one where people are able to have an active relationship with their wider built environment and collectively shape and run it. We believe that it's most critically important in the creation of any specific space that tries to serve new ideas of art or culture. That's totally fundamental. Um, and we really try to explore this gap between the people that live in a city and the forces that govern how it is built around them. So there's a number of gaps we are witnessing at this moment in time, to name a, a few. In the UK, there's a lack of consideration and voice for children in relation to decisions which will affect their lives the most. There's inequality in access to resources, technology, space. Um, there's short-termism of politics compared with the durational reality of the city. It really undermines attempts at community-led development. Um, and so to just quickly describe what these three words mean, culture for us is a kind of combined day-to-day activity of the people as a collective. Education is cultural transmission, so it's kind of what we see as an ideal form of education is one where learning can be self-directed, um, and that is a symptom of individual freedom. So people can explore the world and find their own meaning within it. And that, is the best, in its best form, enables a kind of attitude to be formed, which is a continued practice which then can be pursued through everyday life. And arts, um, I believe, are the kind of expressive outcomes of a particular, any particular cultural situation. Um, so the conditions that allow for art production, cultural activity, and leisure time. Um, and arts generally, or always, uh, heavily rely on economics, so both the security of the individual and the structures within which they are supported. Um, so I want to use this moment to make a case for open learning space, um, which is something I think contains three key ideas or facets which are really fundamental to pursue or consider. Um, in the creation of space for arts and cultural education. Um, the first being space that is open to all, and this is about creating access, so arts and cultural space and education should be for everyone. Um, we need to consider that means the kind of economic and time pressures on people's lives and how you can overcome some of those hurdles that stop people from being able to access spaces that you might be making. And we need to kind of provide for a wide range of needs in order to create pluralistic space for overlapping but diverse interests where you get the richest kind of environments um, in order to learn from a wide variety of voices. And this may require ongoing outreach, management, social work, um, people who are not used to using these kind of spaces or um, aren't familiar with what their potential could be. Um, it's kind of a constant work to make sure that those, that, that opportunity is being understood. Um, space, open learning space is also about creating space for open-ended learning. Um, so I think that arts and cultural space should encourage self-directed exploration. So spaces both for conversation and, and kind of production as well. Um, 
space that is itself open to learning. So this means a space which is evolving and encourages adaptation and amendment and can be reimagined or reoccupied in different ways. Um, probably at moments will be messy, or at least in some parts should encourage messiness. Um, that resources should be shared and explicit, people should know what is available. Um, and that everything is the kind of medium of work, so everything is up for grabs. Um, organizational management, use of tools and kind of social networks. Um, and I want to basically run through a number of different projects that we've um, worked on. Some of them are complete, some of them are still ongoing. Um, that have tried to address these ideas of, of space, open learning space, um, in different situations and at a variety of different levels. Um, so Granby Street was once a busy high street at the center of one of Liverpool's most diverse communities. And the demolition of all but four of Granby Street's the Victorian terraces during decades of kind of top-down, misguided and crude regeneration initiatives saw a once thriving community kind of decimated and scattered. And after the unexpected housing market crash left the remaining four streets kind of just basically filled with tinned up houses. So it's really through the resourceful and kind of dynamic, tenacious actions of, of a group of residents that were fundamental to finally bringing these streets out of dereliction and back into use. So over two decades, they cleared, planted, painted, and campaigned in order to reclaim their streets. And in 2011, they entered into an innovative, innovative form of community land ownership which is the Community Land Trust, in order to bring back empty homes into use as affordable housing. So we worked with them and Steinbeck Studios um, to present a sustainable and incremental vision for the area that built upon the hard work already done by the residents. And a number of projects have evolved over the past six years of our involvement in this community. So, our work has kind of included the design of 10 houses on Kern Street. So this is a refurbishment of 10 Victorian terraced houses. Um, learning from the lived, I'm going to go back one. Learning from the lived experience of long-term residents in the neighborhood to create an index of kind of spatial moves that they had enacted on their own pro homes. And then through a process of simple repair and adaptation, create community-owned affordable housing for rent and for sale. Um, <coughs> One member of the collective also leads on the ongoing creative direction of Granby Workshop, which is on the same street as those houses, um, which is a social enterprise um, we established through the Turner Prize in 2015, which we were nominated for as a result of the work that we've been doing in this, in this neighborhood, essentially for a housing project. This is a, a Kickstarter video that we made Last, a year and a half ago, um, trying to launch, well, did launch a new range of products um, called Splatware, which is about using this industrial ram press um, to produce cups and plates. Um, but the workshop itself came out of this opportunity where suddenly we had this platform um, of the Turner Prize which is essentially a PR exercise um, run by the Tate to promote a, and conversation around modern art in the UK. Um, and that basically offers a lot of press coverage. And we were trying to think of ways in which this moment could not be detrimental to the community we were working in. And so we thought actually using that as an, a kind of conduit to channel investment into the neighborhood and start a business, start creating jobs, start creating the other things in a city that need to sit in amongst the housing, um, was, a, was the kind of made the most sense of, of that opportunity. So for the houses, we'd designed these particular moments of, of care and consideration where when the properties were, were boarded up, um, everything of value was ripped out of them. And so they were just kind of these shells which although had had you know, 
generations of people living in them and had all this personality, they were kind of gutted from that. So we made um, bathroom tiles and mantelpieces using kind of demolition waste from the houses as they were being um, redeveloped and repurposed those materials in the homes in kind of unique like architectural features. So those products were the basis of starting this new business. <coughs> and really, we, we started focusing on architectural ceramics a kind of a little bit later on, once the business had learned a little bit. Um, and yeah, it was based around an idea that the values about kind of uniqueness and people's care in their own homes could also be translated to a kind of manufacturing process. So taking that priority in, in the kind of design product and trying to translate that also into production and a set of rules. So these are the workshop rules about the making of products should invite chance and improvisation so that every product is different, use experimental processes but be simple in their form, be enjoyable and challenging to make, um, and the idea was basically to support employment and creativity in Granby Four Streets, but also to do that so that even if you're making repetitive processes where people are, are, are manufacturing things en masse, they are still, every single, mo every iteration of that is a kind of creative act, and so they're still having um, input and ownership over the production of each of these pieces. Um, we've really, it's, it's kind of evolved over time, and now we're really trying to balance this, what it would mean to introduce these ideas around improvisation and um, introduction of kind of chance into in industrial processes and industrial machinery. Um, yeah, so then the, lo the one that I actually, so this is also another project that's a part of this kind of collection of things that have been happening over the six years within this, within actually one street. Um, it is a, two of the houses that were in too bad a condition to be turned back into um, affordable homes. Um, we've been working to design and develop the Winter Garden as a project that combines a kind of growing space with creative activities. So these are the two things that the residents were already doing in that neighborhood. That was the culture which was already there. Um, and to try and create a space which can support that and protect it, even whilst the, the makeup of the community is changing and undergoing kind of radical growth. Um, so this is the kind of two properties side by side, terraced housing, um, one of which is kind of community garden space, this is a render, and then this is tree planting that happened really three weeks ago. Um, and the other side is a meeting room and also a studio flat, which is important because it's a way of generating revenue so that the community can continue to, you know, make some money to cover ongoing maintenance and it doesn't become a burden on them and fall into disrepair. And also it's an, going to be a place where a residency program happens, um, which is really exciting because it's going to be a program which is giving the same platform and the same space and the same resources to local practitioners, kind of amateur artists from the neighborhood, as well as international artists, and sitting those side by side, kind of collapsing that hierarchy of value where people you know, privilege one, one way of producing art over another. Um, Yes. Um, so these projects are kind of, oh, I'm going to, yeah, they're small scale and they th are incremental and resident led. Um, and I think it's important that the kind of like nature of our role has changed not only in the kind of work we've been doing but also in our relationship to those people. So we were offering kind of professional services and now we're kind of co-authoring projects, um, sometimes living as neighbors, sometimes working as friends. Um, and that it's very opportunistic and kind of open-ended and, and um, there's no kind of single vision uh, that is defining how that area is developing. So the Cinerolium is the second project I wanted to talk about, and this was the kind of first 
um, thing that we ever did together as a group. Um, it was a project we embarked upon without any kind of expectation of creating a practice out of it. Uh, it was a self-initiated project which turned a derelict petrol station into a cinema and kind of brought together these two um, declining typologies in the city, so the petrol station and the, and the picture palace, this kind of idea of a glamorous um, independent cinema. Um, the project was a kind of experiment in the potential for wider reuse of empty petrol stations. It was meant to be a provocation for this particular kind of typology. And so the kind of classical elements of, of that you would expect to see in a picture palace uh, were recreated for roadside setting using cheap industrial reclaimed or donated materials. So we made flip-up seats from scaffolding boards, and the foyer was furnished with formica school chairs and tables, and the auditorium was enclosed by a curtain created um, by, from roofing membrane underlay. So it was kind of visibly handmade, built on site by us, and with a wider team of over 100 volunteers who were learning and experimenting together, aided by instruction manuals written during the prototyping process. Um, but unlike the kind of out-of-town multiplex, the Cinerolium celebrated the social experience of film going from popcorn machine and bar in the old station shop through to the program of a kind of classic, um, yeah, approachable films. So separated from the busiest single lane road in Europe by only a tiny curtain, <laughs> it allowed for both collective escapism um, and created a public spectacle on the street for passers-by. So at the end of the film, the curtain rose, pushing the audience from the imaginative world of the film back onto the everyday theatre of the street. And in one sense, the structure in the city itself was our kind of collective education space through that process. And that was what felt so extraordinary about that time. We were able to realise something that we had imagined collectively, and it was really empowering trying to reimagine that this kind of derelict urban typology, the petrol station, might be... Um, what it might be, and making change in the, in the fabric of the city. Um, it was a very different way of operating to what... Or operating, I mean, being in the world than, than any of us had really experienced before, which felt direct, agile, and vital, um, albeit on a kind of temporary st structure and a small scale. And I wanted to, at this moment, just include this quote from Lena Bobardi, which I think is really beautiful one, the, the artist's freedom has always been individual, but true freedom can only be collective. And I think that's really what we're here to talk about today, is like how can we support one another to have the freedom to create or reimagine the world um, and make and learn? Um, and how can we do that together? So the economy of kind of many hands and this way of using materials um, from the Cinerolium is something that we carried through to our next project, which was fully for a flyover. It's kind of under the A12, which is a motorway on the east side of London, um, where it splits in two. It was a site that was identified by Muff Architecture and Art, who a couple of us in the collective were working for at the time. And it transformed this kind of undi well, used for burning out coaches, um, motorway undercroft into an arts venue in public space and kind of testing out whether that was possible, whether people would come there. So over the course of nine weeks, 40,000 local residents, artists and visitors from across London came and performed, ate, watched, and got involved with workshops. Oh, no, I'm going to go back one. Um, talks, walks, and theatre, starting with the idea that how spaces are imagined is often as important as their physical characteristics in determining their use. So they fully really reclaimed the future of this site by reimagining its past as a kind of fairy tale um, narrative about a stubborn landlord who refused to move to make way for this motorway which was subsequently built around him, leaving him with his r pitched roof kind of stuck between the east and westbound lanes. Um, so we curated the program, had an extensive kind of range of activities, um, working with the Barbican mainly and lots of local organizations and businesses. By day it ho hosted a cafe, yoga workshops, events and boat trips exploring the canal and at night audiences congregated on the building steps to watch 
screenings um, ranging from blockbuster animation cl classics to early cinema kind of accompanied by a live score. And it was designed as a, as a kind of giant construction kit because none of us wanted it to reference the industrial brick buildings in the neighborhood, but none of us were bricklayers. So we developed a, a process which meant that we could still be involved in the construction, we could still make it happen. Um, and anyone else who was passing again could still get involved. So the walls of the folly were interwoven kind of bead curtain of timber bricks, essentially, all kind of tied back to the scaffolding substructure. Um, there was 14,000 of them, so it was quite an intense process. Um, <laughs> and by the end, we were all kind of dreaming of, of wooden bricks. Um, with the fact that it was dry construction, didn't have any mortar, though, was really important because it meant that at the end of the summer, when the structure was taken down, they could be unstrung and used to make new play and kind of planting facilities at a local primary school. Um, and following the success of the project, the London Legacy Development Corporation, which was the organization overseeing the Olympic Park, which was, it was on the edge of, um, invested money into the site, um, permanent infrastructure like water and power, which meant that it potentially could continue as a public space. And it, it is a public space. But actually, we're at this moment where because there's been no one that has been assigned to manage that, and no one really has communicated the fact that this resource is there, um, it's being used in ways which are, which means it's just kind of falling into disrepair, basically. And people are using it um, kind of for skating and like creating informal like, sculpture parks and stuff. But ironically, now the council has actually come and said that maybe we're going to rebuild a fence around the site which they had invested money in to make public because something about the nature of the activity there, not, you know, it's not, it feels somehow threatening. So it's something we're having a conversation with at the moment. Um, so those first two projects, Cinerome and Project Folly, were formative to the way that we kind of work as a collective and kind of seeded some of the shared interests which hold us together, which we developed through later projects, so working with our hands and construction as a kind of social activity, um, which I will talk about in a quite different context here with Goldsmith's Contemporary Center for Contemporary Art, which is the largest project we've ever undertaken and opened about a month and a half ago. Um, so we were commissioned by the University of London, Goldsmiths, to create a new public art gallery within a grade two listed former Victorian bathhouse in New Cross. Um, it's like a thousand square meter building and accommodates seven new gallery spaces, a cafe, curator studio, and event space. And it's meant to be a kind of critical testing ground for exploration and discussion. It's really gonna, you know, it's a significant cultural resource for students, so there's the art school which basically surrounds this building, um, artists and the wider public offering a diverse program focusing on exhibitions, events and education. So, situated next to Thetford Town Hall and the busy high street, the bars had a central role in Lewisham's kind of cultural sit history, but in 1898, um, the public laundries provided an important yeah, the, I mean, it, cl it's, it closed in 1991, basically. And today, the main bath halls are used as artist studios for the students. Um, so the gallery spaces comprised of the former kind of water tanks and service areas of the baths. So our approach really tried to identify this hidden aspect of Lewisham's social history by opening up these um, traditional kind of back-of-house spaces to create a new interface with the public. And you can't really see it <laughs> because it's a really dark photo. Um, but this is in one of the water tanks, um, which is now an exhibition space. Um, has a quite remarkable installation in it, actually, at the moment. So this kind of raw and robust nature of Victorian service spaces has a powerful quality. And the gallery has been kind of molded from these found conditions, creating an ensemble of rooms able to host a diverse and challenging artistic program. So these are the cast iron water tanks, which have been preserved and made accessible. Um, 
whilst new kind of top lit galleries have been created to provide a distinct spatial counterpoint. Um, so there's a new hole in this in this kind of institution, which is comprised of both found spaces, adapted spaces, and in inserted spaces. And central to the proposal is a kind of double height project space, so it's formed by carving a void within the existing floor plate, which is going to become the kind of theatrical and social heart of the building uh, through hosting a range of events from talks to performances and screenings, um, and will offer opportunities to engage the public in ongoing conversations around contemporary art practice. So what was really critical about the way that we approached this project was trying to still, despite working at a kind of scale where risks are much higher um, and delivery processes working with kind of traditional conventional contractors, there's less room for kind of material exploration maybe, we still developed a number of kind of bespoke architectural elements. So we developed um, this kind of concrete facade by staining um, uh, uh, cement board panels and rearticulating corrugated uh, board, um, and did a lot of casting for different kind of furniture pieces. Produced the chair, which I showed a photo of earlier, um, and also made some ceramic architectural elements. Um, so the idea that this kind of legibility of the hand as the whole of our environment is built by hand, and our city is built by people's hands. Um, and this kind of direct robustness to material application can still have a home um, in something which is very much of a, of a kind of more civic, grander, high production um, scale of, of project. Um, so in terms of the way that our practice has evolved, um, one thing that has been really key for us in terms of education space is our studio. Um, and this is called Sugar House Studios. So it, it was originally uh, based in Stratford High Street and conceived of um, in collaboration with the LLDC. Um, it sought to find a way for private practice, our kind of own research and design projects, um, to be opened up to form the backdrop for a public building. So the kind of light industrial shed had a retrofit which was focused on it exploiting the assets of, of uh, kind of existing building and making light touch inexpensive adjustments to the fabric of the building. So maintaining kind of flexibility and kind of changeability over time to kind of test out different business models and use. Um, so, it hosted a wide variety of stuff over the course of the five years that we were there. So was, we used to run a cafe and a pizzeria, um, a cinema, there was construction workshops with local school children, exhibitions, late night events, um, and also then subsequently started moving more into a kind of community of makers and sharing workspace. Um, yeah, it was also a kind of, there was enough space, this kind of generosity of space to kind of spill out and test things at a scale which, we, which is not that readily available in London um, where space is at such a premium. Um, and really it also enabled us to, to play with the fabric of the space around us as well in a, in a kind of more specific way when we developed an interim kind of prototype uh, workspace, which was called Yard House, um, which designed kind of very efficiently, trying to use just like uh, very rational timber structure in order to create an affordable workspace, um, with investing mainly in the kind of shared social spaces. So that was really important to have people coming together and prioritize that. So the circulation in the kitchen. Um, and we put an open call out for people to occupy the bays between the columns. So when people were pitching to rent this, this is all that was available. Oh. Yeah. Um, and then tenants basically rented the space and then finished the works to design their units independently. So everyone was different, everyone actually suited their own needs, everyone um, also gained you know, a sense of real ownership of their space because they had 
they developed it. And, and yeah, and then we also, oh, sorry, let's go back. Um, yeah. Um, we also had a kind of tiled facade, so by, made by Molly King, who's an artist here, shown here, who would eventually go on to be one of the tenants. Um, and here you can see her producing some of the 1500 tiles, which would then cover the facade. Um, which really this kind of like co-authored process meant that the final outcome was much richer than any of us could ever have conceived of in the first instance because it was one that was left to, had kind of, was a hybrid of lots of different kind of inputs. Um, and so became kind of multi-layered. Um, yeah, so this, in this project, we designed it, fundraised for it, constructed, constructed it, managed it, eventually deconstructed it, because um, the idea was it was meant to be a model for temporary occupation of space awaiting development. Because um, in London, there's lots of large-scale projects where it'll be phased, and so you'll have huge areas where think nothing will happen for five, ten years. And, and spaces at such a premium that it felt like a good thing to try and test out whether you could have a very cheap building that tried to create space that was usable and um, could mean that that, that resource wasn't lost. Um, so it's been deconstructed de and then it's going to be rebuilt elsewhere out west. Um, we have since moved to Bermondsey um, because that whole area was now been de de being developed. Um, and for the second iteration, we continue to kind of bring all the tenants and collaborators from the first um, iteration of Sugar House. Uh, so this version is located on the former site of a school, um, which also is due to be demolished to make way for large developer-led housing scheme. Because um, this is the only way we can secure large enough spaces by having a very precarious lease. Um, and in the interim, our aim is to kind of provide workspace for artists, designers, and fabricators around a core kind of common set of facilities that enable and support co-working and collaboration. Um, so we've converted the former school's ground floor swimming pool and dance studios into self-contained studio spaces. And tenants have access to a fully equipped wood workshop and mill, which is set up and maintained by another collective of um, carpenters. Um, and the space is also occupied by architects, artists, um, the ceramics collective who you can kind of access kiln uh, use. Um, there's metal workshop, graphic designers, record labels, sound designers, music studios, and a band practice room. Um, critically, Sugar House is also occasionally open to the public through events, um, whether that's hosted by us or by studio tenants, and that this kind of large-scale space and overlapping community of people who can share knowledge and, and work between one another um, has been used for the development, construction, and assembly of like numerous projects for the local area around Sugar House, and that's in both of its kind of, both in its East London iteration and its South London iteration, and also for further afield. Um, so, yeah, I guess the, if that, in a way, is our kind of learning environment where we can have access to space and make, and the space can learn from our needs, and um, we, this project, perhaps, is an attempt to try and recreate the value that we find in that open-endedness um, for another community and another very different situation. Um, so Baltic Street Adventure Playground is a permanent child-led space where children can play freely and deeply. Um, it's free to access and children are free to come and go as they choose. Uh, the site is looked after um, by a group of three adults who support the children in their play, cook food daily and provide warm waterproof clothes. Um, it's in East Glasgow in Dalmanic um, and it grew out of a public art commission um, 
that had its origins in the Commonwealth Games. So it was a public art commission to celebrate the construction of this Emirates building, you can see um, on the top right hand corner. Um, and, you know, this is in an area of city development, city planning, which is, you can just read the fact that it's being changed through the lens of a master plan, and that is the closest level of grain that anyone is considering it. Because there's just like, these huge waves of demolition, there's this hoarding everywhere, it's in incredibly bleak, and this community and this kind of housing estate was kind of sandwiched between a, like a four, four or five lane road, um, and then everything else was demolished around the side of it, and then the stadium at the top. So they lost their high street, they lost their playground, they lost their community center. Um, and, you know, it's just kind of one thing if you're an adult and you have agency over, um, some agency over yourself and your kind of your conditions that you're putting yourself in. But if you're a child and these processes are taking five, ten years, that could be your whole entire childhood surrounded by processes of disempowering change. Um, and, you know, this is the kind of only thing that is, that's the offer for you, that's it. Um, so we really wanted to try and use the, this opportunity of, of money coming into the area, this arts project, um, public art money, um, to create a space that could really challenge that and counter that experience of the city. So make somewhere that was an experience where they felt autonomy and, f and could have self-determination, authoring control of the space. So the playground has, is f just over five years old now. Um, children has, are supported to kind of self-organize and play workers maintain kind of secure, nurturing environment which is con constantly evolving on a moment-to-moment -moment and month-to-month -month basis in response to the children's growing needs, dreams, and capacity to affect change. So the whole process of building the park um, was mainly just about putting in infrastructure and securing ownership of the land. Um, but at every point, we made sure that everything was visible to the kids was going on, so play, they were still occupying the site, and at no point was it taken away from them and then handed them back with a finished um, kind of project. So Baltic Street, I guess, kind of argues for c the continued relevance of the adventure playground as a counterpoint to the pressures of modern urban childhood, believing that it's still a refuge of simple but a powerful set of ideas about how childhood and our relationship um, to our immediate environment should be realized or could be realized. Um, the project now operates as a kind of informal food bank for the area, giving away free food for those suffering from food poverty, but who might not go to an official food bank because of its stigma. And they've also been trialing an outdoor nursery on site um, this year, and next year we'll actually be starting one permanently. So over the past five years, we've been very much involved in kind of supporting the staff and training and organizational development, rather than any like f design of play structures. Um, we help with recruitment, we're kind of trustees on the charity now, um, aid fundraising efforts, um, and we also go as a big group, so this was in Easter, to uh, go up to help support larger pieces of infrastructure with the kids um, that they wouldn't be able to do alone. Um, and it's, yeah, really, the project is, is, has been in the people, and like this was a situation which is very different to Liverpool, where Liverpool had kind of actors who, or catalysts, maybe we were talking about earlier, individuals who had the tenacity and, you know, um, dyn dynamism to um, make stuff happen. Whereas in this community, there wasn't, that wasn't really the case. So. It's been, the project has been mainly working with these two brothers to support them to have experiences of these different places that are also offering a similar kind of ethos of space, adventure play spaces around Europe. Um, and then to take that learning and to try and form an organization around them that can continue to run, um, hopefully, into, into the long-term future. Um, this is, another project which we have had an ongoing role in. 
Um, and I think that kind of like long-term relationship is something which is really interesting and for me personally has resulted in the kind of richest projects that we've been a part of. Um, so Otto, Pro Otto Projects is a purpose-built workshop and performance space uh, for experimental music, for the experimental music venue Cafe Otto and it occupies a disused site in Dalston, East London. So rubble find on, found on site was used to create a single monolithic volume for exper experiential and educational performance. Um, the construction method, very much like the kind of traditional London stock brick of the 19th century where you had clay pits readily available, was based on using resources that were local at little or no cost. And in this case, that meant demolition rubble which was already on the site, rather than clay. So the earth, rubble, and gravel on this otherwise empty site was gathered, sieved, bagged, and compressed, and transformed into waste, into giant kind of building blocks. And deep kind of rubble walls were finished with a decorative rubble dash render and topped with a lightweight timber trust roof. So the project was built by us um, and 60 volunteers over the summer of 2013 and delivered in association with the Barbican. Um, the building itself was created by, and also in turn, facilitated the strengthening of a community of musicians and artists who now play, record, and tour with each other really regularly. Um, and Assemble also has worked on exhibitions, performances, and renovations both within and outside the building. Um, since its inception, we carry out maintenance and extension works um, and we've also recently started having conversations about larger scale development on the rest of the site um, surrounding it. So the space is free to use, which means it can fuel a kind of rehearsal culture that, and experimental practice that would not be able to exist otherwise. Um, and over the years, the users of the space have kind of edited it and changed it uh, to to suit their needs again. As the seasons have changed and the types of use have evolved, uh, they've built walls, sealed panels, hung acoustic barriers. Um, many of the people who use the space work with their instruments through improvisation. And I like to think the same is true of the building. So it's not a refined space, but it's one that's kind of gathered from its surroundings and formed through exploration of, of, con of construction. Um, the last project I wanted to, to touch on was recently, in September, uh, we collaborated on a teaching project uh, with the choreographer and dancer Fernanda Munoz Nosen to work with design and performance students at the Iceland Academy of Arts. And making building culture started with the fundamental building blocks of our culture, which is ourselves, and slowly moved outwards. Um, from the body to the city to networks to questioning culture um, <coughs> with the main idea which I've mentioned feels really critical at this moment and in this space um, that culture is contingent um, it's not coincidental it happens as a result of the structures and behaviors and spaces that we make and undertake but it wholly relies on us enacting those structures and perpetuating those behaviors so we can continue that line of reason to really question how education is structured. Like, that is also contingent, and the city, therefore, is also contingent. Um, the conversation through this process was really structured around uh, talking about what resources were available to this group at that moment. Um, how are those resources shared, protected, reclaimed, created, governed, and distributed without overuse and abuse? And there's kind of like emotional and energetic resources as well as like facilities and things that they can access in the city. And I think all of those things are, th are really important when we're thinking about individuals who are going to be using and accessing space for culture and arts education. Um, we considered the repercussions of kind of physical space by exploring different parts of the city and um, across Reykjavik. Um, and though those of us who are employed 
to teach in this situation, we brought the conversation, it was one of kind of parity and openness. And it was acknowledged that everyone in this instance has as much experience as each other. So everyone has knowledge of their body, of their culture, and also of their body's relation to and within that culture. Um, again, helping to kind of readdress a gap of sorts. And it feels like that is 100% true and should be considered when we're, when we're thinking about the creation of space for arts and cultural education, that everyone has these fundamental understandings of the world and capacity to learn from their environment, um, and that that's something which should be respected um, through an idea of equality. Um, so for the last slide, I just wanted to return back to this idea of open learning space, um, this kind of proposal. Um, and I think I've shown that building space can be an opportunity for strengthening creative collective communities, that it can bring arts and cultural activities into residential areas, maintaining kind of fine grain of activities in the city. Um, editable space can enable people and groups to explore their sense of control um, and agency in the world um, and the important like psychological aspects that that brings. Um, education spaces are also those cultures that exist, invisible structures that exist um, around institutions and between practitioners in the city. So, um, yeah, I mean, just maybe something for discussion later on to think about space as something which is also structured through unseen um, uh, connections and networks. Um, really, I think the nature of an opportunity in working with the development of new cultural and arts education spaces will be de determined by three things. Um, that is, you know, the culture, like what values, a question to ask yourself, what cap values are you bringing? What are your assumptions that you're, you're taking to this work? Um, what are the opportunities for access? Who are you doing this work for? Um, and what is the process by which you're realizing your project? And that doesn't mean at the end of, you know, delivery. I mean, it, as was said um, aptly um, by, by the previous speaker, you know, this, the building that we're in currently is a process. You know, we're existing in one moment in, in a kind of extended realization of a project and it's open-ended and, and we don't necessarily know what that looks like um, in its final form yet, but that still should be an ongoing question about how delivery is being managed, what kind of um, structures are being supported by the decisions we make about where investment goes and where our supply chains are coming from. Um, yeah, and I think these things are those that determine the nature of any space that you're creating. Um, and they need careful consideration um, and that we all need to take responsibility for them um, beyond what we might think are our kind of professional roles because um, we have much broader impacts sometimes than perhaps we realize. Um, so yeah, thank you very much for listening. <laughs>